Camp, you would bring out the best stuff. You offer, you give, Lord. So we just get this opportunity to give a little bit back to you. We just bless this offering. May it be pleasing. May it grow your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And now I'm going to welcome up Luke Hazelmeyer. Good morning. Go ahead and turn your Bibles back to Matthew 16. We're going to be picking up in the same passage we did last Sunday, Matthew 16, verses 21 through 28. I love that Jamie was talking about sacrifice because following Jesus is costly. It costs us something to actually follow Jesus the way that he wants us to. You know, I think a lot of us, if we're being super honest for a moment, we want to fit Jesus into our lives. We want to figure out what is the most efficient way, the, the way that has the most synergy with what I'm already doing. What's the easiest way to kind of fit what he taught and what he wants me to do in with what I'm already doing so that the end result is that I get to keep on living my life basically how I was living it, maybe just a little less wild. And I'm also fulfilling what he, and honestly, we're just starting from the completely wrong place when that's our mindset. Like it costs us something to follow Jesus. And that's the title of my message. Last week it was The Cost of Apprenticeship, part one. Today, real unique and creative, the cost of apprenticeship, part two. <laughs> so I'm going to continue talking about the costliness of following Jesus. Now you might be thinking, man, Luke, no wonder you're not an evangelist. You make following Jesus sound really terrible and not fun at all. <laughs> and perhaps there's a little truth in that. But here's the thing. There's a cost to following Jesus. There's also a cost to not following Jesus. In fact, I would argue it is costlier to say no to the full sacrifice and to say no to the full vision that Jesus outlines as to what it looks like to follow him. It's costlier. And here's the thing. We, the devil, tries to trick us and make us think there's a way to live where we don't got to pay a price. There's a way to live that's not costly. There's a way to live that's just easy. He told Jesus, hey, you don't got to go to the cross. I'll give you all of this. All you have to do is bow down and worship me real quick, and then, you, you know, you won't lose anything. Just a quick knee, quick bow of the knee. But there's a cost. There's a cost to following Jesus, and there's a cost to not following Jesus. And so we don't get to pick whether or not we pay a price. We just get to pick which one we pay. We get to accept, we get to decide which cost we accept and embrace. And I want to tell you that the cost of following Jesus is heavy. It'll take everything out of you. And it'll lead to freedom and victory and joy and peace and love like you could never imagine. Cost of the world, the cost the world asks you to, to pay, it'll feel good for a moment. There'll be some pleasure. And then it'll lead to ruin and destruction in your life and in all of your relationships and everything you set out to do. So I encourage you, pay the price that Jesus asks you to pay. Accept his cost. We're going to talk about, we're going to jump back into the same story we were in last week. But this time we're going to look at the second half of it where Jesus asks his disciples to lay down their own plans for their lives. And that's a pretty, pretty difficult thing. In fact, this might be one of the hardest costs for us to accept. Giving up drinking too much, okay. Giving up drugs, okay. Giving up porn, all difficult to do. Giving up pride, giving up... There's so many things that we're called to give up that are difficult, but not quite like this one. I think laying down your own plan for your life might be one of the most difficult things that Jesus asks us to do, but he does ask us to do it. 
And so we're going to look at where he tells his disciples to do that. Uh, last week, what we talked about was knee-jerk reactions and triggers and how those things reveal worldly ways of thinking in us that show a place where we need to let something go. Uh, they reveal dysfunction in our minds that we need to give to Jesus, those triggers. Let me tell you about, I'm going to review my message in a little more depth in a moment, but let me tell you about a time where I was very triggered, and I had one of those major knee-jerk reactions, and it had to do with the plan that I had for my life. So let me just boil down hours of story into like a few sentences, okay? So in 2018, I'm sitting in a room with my best friend, Wilson, who uh, has been on staff at this church for 10 and a half years, and he's being launched into his own ministry in October. So excited for that. I'm sitting with him. I'm sitting with Van, our current senior pastor and founding pastor, who has been a second dad to me ever since I was nine years old. And I'm sitting with our consultant that we had for the church. And we are talking in this particular conversation about a problem, or really a series of problems that existed with a ministry that I was leading, along with Wilson. And the problems, if I could summarize them, were one, I had an unhealthy perspective of this ministry. I viewed it as something that was kind of a part of Vineyard Northwest, but was also kind of its own independent thing. Two, I had an unhealthy lack of accountability for this ministry. I basically had no checks and balances on any decision that I would made, uh, same for Wilson. And then three, I had a selfish regard for this ministry. I would have told you it was God's and it's all his, but really, if I was being totally honest, it was mine. That's how I felt about it. So, that's the problem, and all that stuff had sort of been under the surface for the previous years, and maybe it popped out every so often, but it wasn't blatantly obvious, even to me. But like any good consultant, our consultant was able to notice it, and then he highlighted it and put his finger on it and said, this needs to change. And so we started having a conversation about what sorts of changes were needed to make that ministry that I was leading, that I had been leading for a long time, more healthy. And they included the obvious things, like, hey, let's change our perspective a little bit. Let's make this like a, let's, let's now, let's agree, this is a bona fide ministry of Vineyard Northwest. Uh, let's add some more accountability over Luke and Wilson that uh, gives some checks and balances to certain decision-making power and and let's kind of redesign some aspects of this ministry so that it uh, benefits rather than harms the entire church. You know, obvious stuff. And I wish I could say that I was like, yes, great idea. I love it. But I, I didn't. I was triggered. And I was triggered perhaps more than I've been in my life. And of course, when you're triggered, you don't think logically about what was happening. I couldn't see what was happening as necessary fine tunings to make something good a little better and more healthy. The way I saw it was this ministry that I've poured my life and soul into is being ripped out of my hands. Like it really felt like something was being stolen from me in that moment. That was a lie the enemy was telling me. And so in that triggered place, I began to devise a plan for how I could separate from Wilson and Van. Second dad, best friend for 19 years. How I could separate from them, take this ministry with me, and separate from Vineyard Northwest. Again, second dad, best friend, devising a plan of how I could stab them in the back. So, 
We talked and agreed then that the best solution would be that I become the senior pastor, and here we are. That's the story. (laughs) Can you imagine? Oh, man. I'm going to finish that story in a moment. Can I recover from that? I'm going to finish that story in a moment. But first, let me just give you a little context as to why those feelings were so strong for me about that particular ministry. So when I got into ministry, I was a sophomore in college. I was 20 years old, or sorry, when I felt called to ministry. Uh, And uh, besides local pastors, the pastor that... I looked up to the most and admired the most was a megachurch pastor from Chicago who at age 23 had started a church in a movie theater and then grew it to be the largest megachurch in all the United States. And when I thought about my future, I thought about him. Like, I want to do what he did. I feel like I can do what he did. That was my dream. That was my plan for my life. Well, when I was 22, a few months away from turning 23, Uh, Wilson and I, who I mentioned earlier, accidentally started a young adult ministry. And what I mean by that is we started discipling one of our friends who had been far from God, and he decided he wanted to know more about God. And then as we discipled, as we were discipling him, meeting meeting with him, talking about the Bible, talking to him about Jesus, other guys started wanting to get in, and and we didn't have any marketing strategy. We we weren't trying to grow this thing, but like a snowball, it just kind of grew exponentially got to a point where we wanted to, uh, some of the guys wanted to bring their girlfriends into this ministry because we had such a strong sense of community. And so we went and found some uh, women, some uh, leaders who were women that we really respected. Um, Amanda Patton, she was Amanda Richburg. Jen Cochran, she was Jen Jordan. Brought them in. And once it was co-ed, Then it was like the snowball was just like turned into a full-blown avalanche. And I still remember the first time that I was standing in Van and Lori's living room and I looked out the window and I saw a person walking down the driveway to come attend that Bible study who I'd never seen before, who I didn't know. And it was this really crazy, I'll never forget it, it was this really crazy feeling like, wow, like we're doing something here that is like, attracting and bringing in people I don't even know. What the heck? Well, then it just sort of, you know, one person turned to two I didn't know, turned to five I didn't know, turned to 10 I didn't know, turned to 15 I didn't know. Like not, I'm talking about each night, you know, five each night, seven each night, eight each each week that we we met. Um, And I could tell so many stories about that season, but let me just show you a few pictures and videos to to sort of help you visualize it. So if you want to throw that first one up, this was in 2013. That's Van and Lori's basement. And at that point, we had chairs around the entire perimeter of the basement. Every chair is full. And we're like, this is crazy. Look at all these people. Go on to the next one. That was the second of these meetings that we started. And that was in... uh, Forest Park in Amanda Patton's mom's basement. And what was, you can go back. I want to talk about that. And what was crazy about uh, that meeting was that was the first time that this second group that we started met. And we were really worried about this second group because we had been averaging about 45 or 50 young adults at Van and Lori's for about a year, or actually for about a few months at that point. And we're like, shoot, when we send half of our young adults to this other group and the half stay behind, uh, what's going to happen to the sense of momentum? Are are we going to like kind of destroy this ministry that we started by doing this like separate in half and start a second group thing? And well, uh, the first night of this new group, we had 45 people. So we were averaging 45, we split in half, and now we have 45 I remember sitting there like, is this like the loaves and the fish happening before my eyes? What, like what's going on? And then the Friday group had 65 people. 
It's like we separated in half and, and the second group grew by 20. Kingdom math does not make sense. Well, go on to the next one. <laughs> Two reasons I want to show you this picture. One, that's Micah Turnbow sitting up there leading a Bible study 10 years ago. <laughs> secondly, secondly, that particular night, we had 84 people show up at Van and Lori's house, and we didn't have enough places in the house or even around the house for Bible studies. So I remember telling Micah, take your group, go find a spot in the lawn, sit down. That's where you're going to do your Bible study. That's where he chose, and I walked down and took a picture of him. Uh, next picture. You can now see, not only are the chairs full, all of the room on the floor is full of people. Like there literally is, I mean, if there had been, thank God there was never a fire because it would have been bad. But <laughs> like every, every chair is full, every spot on the ground in the middle of the chairs is full. If you can't see it, there's a stairwell going up into their, second, into their main floor. That whole stairwell is full of people. It's crazy. Next picture, there's... <laughs> That's our uh, group that we started in Westchester, the third group we started. That's Wilson, uh, just on a crazy packed night, being, being Wilson. And then this was a picture of one of our leaders' retreats. So those are not just the people in the ministry. Those are just the leaders that were in the ministry uh, down in Gatlinburg. And then lastly, a picture, I think, from worship from that particular retreat. I also want to show you a few videos. So this first video, before you roll it, it's real short. It's just to kind of get a feel for what it was like being at those meetings. But if you listen, in the background, uh, we used to start all of our gatherings with people sharing God stories. And the guy in the background is sharing about how he had led his brother to Christ that night before, which is a very normal sort of story that people would tell at the beginning of the groups. Uh, so go ahead and roll that video. Sure, hit it. Up to... My brother has been going through a lot of uh, bad stuff, and uh, just the other night I was talking to him for a long time. He decided to give his life to Jesus. Wow! Uh, Come on! Here, hit it. And then, uh, lastly, you can. Lastly, uh, here's a video from worship from one of those retreats that I mentioned. <laughs> Such a fun season of life. And I'm not exaggerating when I say, like, I was living my dream during that season of life. Everything I'd ever wanted to do, I was doing. And I didn't have the mega church, but by that point, I had, my vision had evolved into, I think there's something better than a mega church for uh, this generation. And I think actually, uh, we're actually kind of getting sick of sort of the mega church culture and some of the negative, amongst many good things, some of the negative things come along with that. Um, so I, I was really living my dream. I was living out my ideal plan for my life. And so you might be thinking, well, what led from that moment to what I described earlier, where I uh, felt this impulse to, to uh, selfishly and, in, and kind of just terribly uh, separate from this church and everyone and all the you know two of the main people that have loved and known me my whole life well i'm gonna get to that but why don't we it's already been a long time and we haven't got to scripture let's get into scripture to make this official and legal and <laughs> i'll finish my story toward the end so uh, you should be at Matthew 16. Uh, we're not going to read the whole thing because we read it last week, but let me paraphrase 21 through 23. So in, this, in these verses, uh, Jesus tells his 12 apostles that he is going to suffer at the hands of the Sanhedrin, be killed by them, and then rise again the third day. Peter who had just declared Jesus the Messiah 
and then had Jesus say about him, here's the rock on whom I'm going to build my church, Peter decides it's a good time to rebuke Jesus. You're not going to die. You're not going to suffer. You're the Messiah. You're going to be a victorious warlord and crush Rome to the ground. Well, rebuking Jesus, never a good idea. Jesus counter-rebukes and says, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. And uh, the first point that I shared from that message was that the cost of apprenticeship to Jesus is to give up the freedom to believe what makes the most sense to us. The disciples had a picture of what the Messiah ought to be. They had to give that up. We have a picture of so many things, how politics should be, how family should be, how parenting should be, how everything. We have to give a lot of those up if we're going to follow Jesus. My second point was the cost of apprenticeship to Jesus is giving up our ego. So then let's get into the first verse for today, verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers... Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Take up their cross. I'm afraid, as with many parts of the Bible, this particular verse has had its teeth pulled out of it. And what I mean by that is it's been repeated so often, it's such a cliche that we kind of have like this American Christianized version of what it means and not actually what it means. Like, I've heard people say things before like, you know, having to drive 30 minutes to church on Sunday is just the cross that I bear. (laughs) You know? And it's not that there's anything, you know, it's not that that's a non-valuable thing, like the Lord sees that sacrifice, but... Is that really what Jesus was talking about here when he talked about cross-bearing? Let me just read you uh, an excerpt from R.T. France, arguably the most renowned scholar of Matthew ever. And I think he'll help us recapture what we ought to from this text. This is what R.T. France says. Christian readers have become so used to the cross as a word and a symbol that it is hard now to recapture the shudder that the word must have brought to a hearer in Galilee at the time. Crucifixion was a punishment favored by the Romans, but regarded with horror by most Jews, and was by now familiar in Roman Palestine as a form of execution for slaves and political rebels. It was thus not only the most cruel form of execution then in use, but it also carried the stigma of social disgrace when applied to a free person. Crucifixion was an inescapably public fate and drew universal scorn and mockery. That is the prospect Jesus holds out before any worthy disciple, a savage death and public disgrace. You want to follow Jesus? The cost is a savage death and public disgrace. Who's still in? (laughs) At least my first point, which is this. To apprentice under Jesus is to embrace a form of death. Not just accept it, embrace it. And here's the thing. This is still on the table. Like, what Jesus was saying here was not all the things we've metaphorically interpreted to mean. Jesus was telling his disciples, if you want to be my disciple, you are going to die. And not only, not just die from like old age, you are going to die at the hands of the Roman state like I'm going to. And you know, that turned out to be true for all but one of them. Like, he wasn't being metaphorical when he said, take up your cross and follow me. He was being literal. You know, taking up your cross, that the Romans would have the prisoner who's about to be executed on the cross carry their cross from where their trial was to where their execution would be. And so that's what that means to take up your cross. Take it up and start walking with it to the point, of, to the point 
in place, or point in time and place where you're going to be executed on it. So first and foremost, like, if, if we want to follow Jesus, we really need to be willing to die. Like, what if God calls you to go and be a missionary in Iran or North Korea or the Congo or Venezuela? Like, are you going to say yes or no? Where it literally could cost you your life. That's the plain meaning here. That has to be the first meaning we accept. Now, of course, we are so lucky to live in a country where that is almost certainly not going to be our fate. We are almost certainly not going to die for following Jesus. But if our attitude is, whew, thank God I don't have to die. Well, let me just get back to my life. Like, we're totally missing it if that's our attitude. Let me do a, a thought experiment with you real quick. I want you to imagine you're arrested by the Roman Empire in the great persecution in the year like 300 AD, okay? And before that, you had indeed counted the cost and said, yes, I am going to follow Jesus and I'm willing to die for it if that's necessary, okay? So you're in. You're arrested, you're in jail, waiting for your fate, and you know that about 50% of people that are jailed are executed. So you, it's like a 50-50 chance that you're going to live. Your brother gets fed to wild animals in the Colosseum. Your best friend gets taken out and has stones attached to him and is thrown into the sea. And then the night before you're going to be taken out, you have a dream, and Jesus says, you're not going to die, you're going to live a long life. Next morning, they say you're free to go. You're walking back to your village. In that moment, are you thinking to yourself, whew, thank God I didn't die. Okay, well, let me just pick up where I left off. Would you be like, well, Jesus, I'd love to give you more of my time and energy, but, you know, my job is super stressful and my older kids are doing all of these things and my younger kids just zap the energy out of me. And plus, you know, my plate's pretty full. I've got my bowling league or my golf outing or my poker night. You know, I would wake up in the morning and pray, but I need at least eight hours of sleep just to function at all. And I can't go to bed early because that's my winding down time and I need my Netflix time or my social media doom scrolling time. <laughs> oh, and by the way, Jesus, uh, if I do squeeze some time in for your mission, don't you dare send me to any Democrats or any Republicans because they're ruining this country and I don't think I can love them. how would we actually respond if what I described earlier happened? Jesus, you saved my life. Like, I was this close to death. My whole life is yours. I don't care what plans I had for the future. I don't care what I had going on right now. I'm in. I think that's how most of us would react. If, like, if we experience something like that, there's something about a near-death experience where it just changes the way we think. And so, why do I go, why do I say all that? We don't actually, most of us are not gonna actually have to die. True, amazing. How do we live in response to that amazing truth? Do we just live like, you know, like just nominal Christians that go to church and do my thing? Or do we live in radical, full-blown surrender to Jesus out of gratitude for the fact that we don't have to actually die? And you know, I'm not saying that we can get to that heart posture overnight, but the power of the Holy Spirit in us can get us to the point where even if, even though we didn't have to go through the sorts of things that the early Christians had to go through, the early disciples had to go to. We can get to a point if we're willing to say yes to each step that Jesus asks us to take where we are living as radically as they were in our day and our time. 
That's the invitation from this scripture for you. Do you want to just live a normal, boring Christianity that fits into your life and schedule really well? Or do you want to live a full-out, radical, surrendered life to Jesus in the kingdom of God? That's the question for the morning. Skipping ahead, let's get into verse 25 and 26. Jesus says this, For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life, or what will they give in return for their life? And then skipping ahead again, R.T. France, uh, in another quote from him, he writes this, A clear choice is thus offered between self-preservation at all costs and the risky business of following Jesus. But the self that is preserved by such a safe option is not worth preserving since the true self is lost. Van one time got a prophetic word that went like this. There's no safe way to play it safe when it comes to the kingdom of God. So my second point would be this. To apprentice under Jesus is to give up your idea of the good life. And this is really what is the root issue. We have an idea of what the good life is, what a meaningful life is, what a purposeful life is, and we cling to that rather than clinging to what Jesus says the good life is. We come to Jesus and say, Jesus, Okay, you can have all this, 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 and this, but I'm going to just keep this one thing because this is what's really going to make me happy. This is what's really going to make me feel fulfilled. This is really what's going to bring purpose to my life. And you know what Jesus says? Thank you for all that. I want that too. And you know what? I especially want that because that's going to be the thing that is an idol in your life. That's going to be the thing that holds you back from a life, from living, to the, you know, living life to the fullest in the kingdom of God. That's going to be the thing that is a stumbling block for you. So yes, I want that too. Okay, here's what we're going to do with our remaining eight minutes. We're going to have a quick discussion break just to give you a second to process. We'll come back, I'll finish my story, and we'll do a little ministry. Okay? Take two minutes. Turn to somebody nearby. I got three questions for you up on the screen. Uh, what dream or plan has God asked you to lay down in the past? How might your idea of the good life be better aligned with Jesus? And what dream or plan might God be asking you to lay down now? Go ahead, turn to somebody nearby. Answer one of those questions on your mark is set. Go. Take one more minute, one more minute. So there I am, sitting with Wilson and Van, triggered, 
overcome with feelings of anxiety and fear and even some anger. And I'm plotting how I can steal this young adult ministry that I've been leading called House Group and make it my own thing. I don't say anything in that moment. I just kind of go along with the conversation while knowing that whole time that I'm not going to let any of this stuff happen that is pulling this thing out of my hands. Well, a few weeks later, we're having an event here at the church where we are watching a film called Finger of God 2 together. We had popcorn in the auditorium. It was great. I'm sure some of you were here for that. And as I'm sitting in the room watching this video where these different Christian leaders and pastors and evangelists were catching on live video video, miracles that were happening and people's lives were being changed and revivals that were going on throughout the world, the Lord spoke to me. And it was simple. Didn't have a whole lot of description to it, but I knew exactly what he meant. He said, Luke, I want you to lay it down. And he was talking about house group. I want you to lay down the ministry that you have been pouring everything into for the last five years. The dream, the literal dream that you have always, you've had for your life since you got into ministry. The dream that you were living out before your eyes that was everything you ever wanted to do. The thing, I mean, I used to visualize, you know, I was, I was uh, 23 in 2013, I used to visualize in 2043 having like global house group conferences, you know, <laughs> like people, there's, by this point in time, house group is spread beyond Ohio into other states and into other countries. And every year we have like a global conference, you know, in different places. I, th- I had, it sounds funny now, but I, I believed in it. And you know what, when you're seeing miracles happen, like on, on a weekly basis, your mind can be expanded to believe just about anything. And I think it's actually a good thing. So, but he said, lay it down. And then he began to tell me that uh, this expression of revival is good, but it is not the end all be all. I have so much more for you and I have so much more for all of you who are part of this right now. But it's gonna require you letting this go. And it, uh, I'm not, I know, I know it's, it can sound dramatic, it can sound like, come on, dude, you just stopped doing a ministry. But I'm serious. It felt like I was letting a part of myself die. And it felt like I was letting the part of myself that I loved the most die. But I did. I laid it down. Uh, after some, like I said, some toxic thoughts and scheming, uh, eventually I laid it down. And what's crazy is where I am in life right now. Like, getting next month, getting to become your senior pastor is so much better than any picture of the future that I had for myself before. I I couldn't see that back then, but I can see that now. Like, everything that I ever wanted to do and more, I feel like I'm getting to step into in this next season. And you know what? Even more importantly than my own sense of fulfillment if the Lord wouldn't have humbled me in the way he did, my dream would have destroyed me. It would have. And so let me turn it to you now. I know for some of you, there's an aspect of your life or your future, could be a plan or a dream like me, could be a hope. For some of you, it might be, usually this kind of thing is like a career move, like a ministry if you're in ministry, or if you're not. Um, Perhaps marriage and biological children can be one. Whatever it is, I know there's some of you where, and a keyboard person, you can come on up as we wrap up. Um, For some of you, there is an aspect to your life or future that you know you've been holding back from letting Jesus put his hands on if he wants to. Like, you've given him so much. You can list all the things you have given him, but there's that one thing that you're just like, I need to hold on to this. 
Jesus, you can have everything else, but just let me keep this thing. And I'm not saying that Jesus is asking you to like burn it or quit it or I don't know, end it. But what he is saying is your hands are like this. I want you to change them to be like this. Loosen your grip and accept the possibility that I might have a different future for you. And this is not just for young people. Wherever you are in life, whatever your vision of the next part of your life is, whether it's 60 years or 10 years, God has a plan for your life that I guarantee you is better than your own plan for your life. But what it might require is you to let go of, or at least loosen your grip and hold open-handedly, whatever that most important thing is. Secondly, there are some of you where you know you've held a picture of the good life that is probably more worldly than Jesus. Probably includes stuff, I'm not even gonna go into details, but you just know that. You know, I'm not trying to coax you into anything, you just know, like if the Holy Spirit is convicting you right now that you've not had the right picture of the good life, um, I'm talking to you. So if you're in either of those two groups, you wanna, you wanna let go of something you've been holding tightly or you wanna let Jesus redefine the good life for you, just stand up wherever you are. Amazing. If you didn't wanna stand before, because you were nervous, but now you're like, okay, I want to stand now. <laughs> Go ahead, stand now. Do it. You won't regret it. You won't regret it. Yeah, amazing. Come on. If you're nearby one of these people, can you just lay hands on them? You don't have to, but if you feel comfortable. Raise your hand if no one's laying hands on you yet. get some people back here. Yeah. Jesus, thank you for these sons and daughters that are standing before you. And Lord, I ask for a supernatural influx of courage for them to lay down whatever it is you're asking them to lay down. Just let your spirit rest on them. I thank you, Lord. You don't ask us to make these sorts of impossibly hard decisions alone, but you, you give us your spirit to make them. I ask, Lord, you just would even speak to them now, give them, like you spoke to me, just little phrases that, that can let them know and confirm to them what it is you're saying to them. Thank you, you've already been doing that. So I just, I bless all of you with the courage, the favor, the grace to carry out what God is calling you to carry out. The empowerment to carry out the decision, to carry out the mindset shift that he's calling you to carry out. Take a second and just pray for them on your own. But while that's happening, you guys can start praying. If you've got your hand on someone, just start praying for them real quick. While that's happening, prayer teams, you can come forward if you're not already praying or being prayed for. We're going to close here in 30 seconds. If you want prayer for anything at all, any physical healing needs, anything emotional going on, if you want further prayer for whatever is happening right now in you, just come on forward. There's, prayer teams are going to be up here. And... 